Bear in mind when people pray, whether it's myself, or whether it's an elder, or whether it's a, a deacon with Brad, um, we pray these prayers together, right? We just don't listen, but we're called to pray these prayers with the person praying. And the reason why I bring that out is because, I don't know if you noticed, but when Brad began his prayer, he said something to the effect that, Lord, we come humbly now to you in prayer. Humbly. And I thought, well, that's a perfect segue to the very thing that we're going to be considering here this morning, and that is the humility that you and I need in order to come to Christ, to remain in Christ, to flourish in Christ, and to participate in the Lord's Supper here um, this morning. So that's the very theme of the passage we're going to be considering now from Luke chapter 14. So if you have a Bible or you have a device and you want to follow along, I always encourage that. Um, Luke chapter 14, and I want to begin reading at verse 7 and simply read through verse 11, a relatively brief chapter. Um, And it follows a parable or a brief story that Jesus teaches us about usually some very profound spiritual truths. And that certainly is the case here in what is called the parable of the wedding feast. So uh, Luke chapter 14, beginning verse 7, now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor. Saying to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone, and here's here's what we call verse 11, um, the kicker of the passage, the main point of the passage. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, I'm I'm not, I don't know how familiar you are with the Bible. I know many of us have been raised with the Bible. But, you know, it's possible to be raised with the Bible, but not really interact with the Bible or the Scriptures as they call them. Uh, Some of us, I'm sure, are quite regular in delving into what we call the Word of God and being blessed by that. Um, and maybe you're relatively new and you're saying, I haven't really had too much exposure to this book, and that's to be understandable if you did not grow up in the Christian faith. But, but whatever you stand with the Bible, you need to understand that what Jesus says here in the last verse, the main theme of the passage, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who exalts himself uh, or humbles himself will be exalted, that that is actually found in a number of places throughout the Bible, throughout the New Testament and also Um, I was doing a little bit of cross-referencing this morning and noticed not only does Jesus speak about this often, but the apostles do, and also in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah speaks something to the same effect. And it's a reminder to us that um, God is not impressed with a proud heart or a self-sufficient heart, but really What God is impressed with is a heart that is actually what the Bible calls contrite, broken, and a spirit that is needy. Because you see, you you cannot come to Jesus, and you cannot grow in Jesus, and you cannot flourish in the Christian faith. You cannot come to this table, and you cannot inherit eternal life in a spirit of unrepentant pride. But we all have to come before God humbly, sometimes, my friends, even on our hands and knees, to receive his grace and to receive all of what we need through Jesus Christ. And that is, again, forgiveness and reconciliation with God. And that's the main theme of what we're taking a look at here this morning. And Jesus demonstrates this theme in a very simple story. And the story essentially goes like this. And let me, let me put it in a contextual way, in a modern way, so maybe we can all identify with it. Jesus is getting at something that I think um, a lot of us have experienced not all of us here, but, but many of us, and that's a, uh, what he calls here a wedding feast or the modern-day equivalent to that is a, a wedding reception. 
And, you know, if you, if you go to wedding receptions around, it's really interesting, you know, coming from the, the States and having served in a number of churches in the States and actually also one other one in Toronto, Canada, it's very interesting that every culture has a different way of uh, celebrating significant events or not even events that are joyful but difficult and, and we agree, and that's funerals. Everybody, everybody has different customs. But around here I found that there are basic variations on a theme when it comes to wedding receptions. The wedding receptions around here, especially if they're in the summer, tend to be, I don't know, uh, under a tent outside. Uh, sometimes they're in a church building like this. But whatever is the case, we've, many of us have experienced wedding receptions where you go into the wedding reception venue and what do you see? You see decorations, you see tables, you see chairs, maybe you see... Um, a table that is maybe twice as long or three times as long as this, especially if it's a reception of about 150 to 200 people, and you got various assortments of food or hors d'oeuvres or what have you. And uh, then also what you see is this, this uh, long table that's in a certain part under the tent or in the church building. And of course, that's where the wedding party sits, right? So at the ends of the table, what you have is you have the, the bridesmaids and the groomsmen, and then closer to the center, you have the maid of honor, and you have the best man, and then who's at the very center of this long table? You have the bride and the groom. Now, if you do a little bit of research during the days of Jesus, they, they, they oftentimes didn't have a long table, but they had what was called a U-shaped table. So if you can imagine, here's the U, and then at the very bottom of the U, that's the place of honor. That's where the, the bride and groom are. And then you have, um, well, we could apply it to today's situation. You have the best man and you have the main of honor, which those are honorable positions, right? All right. Let's say that you go to that wedding reception and you decide whatever it gets into your system. You get into that, that building or under that tent and you see that long table and you say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go sit down at that long table. Everybody's milling about. Everybody's talking and doing whatever, right? Nobody's formally seated yet because the reception hasn't formally begun. But you decide to go to that table, and you sit toward the center. Maybe you sit in the, the maid of honors situ uh, seat or the, the best man seat, right? You just sit there. But not a lot of people notice that you're doing that. But as things transpire uh, and things get prepared for the, the beginning of the formal wedding reception, people are taking their seats here and there, and there you are sitting at that table, and the wedding party gets up there, and eventually the bride and the groom get up there, and they, they see you sitting there, and they can either do one of two things. They can either awkwardly just allow you to continue sitting there, or what they'll probably do is they'll, they'll come up to you, and they'll, they'll maybe whisper something like this, um, excuse me, but... Um, these seats are reserved for the, like the, the maid of honor or, or the best man. And so I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but perhaps if you could get up and maybe you could go to a table in the back or in the lower part here. Um, I, think, I think there's an opening back there if you would do that. Okay. What are you going to do at that point? Well, you're, you're going to get up and probably do what they say. And now everything's formally begun and everybody's taking a look at you. And they're observing what's taking place, and there's a bit of a hush over the reception. So you get up, and you gradually go all the way to the back, and you take a seat. Now, what, what Jesus is doing is he's expanding on what I just told you. Hope you engage your imagination a little bit with that. Imagine yourself in that very situation. And the point that Jesus is making here is it's not, it's not about table manners. It's not about wedding reception etiquette. But it's about the very thing that drove you to seek out that place of honor at the long table. Or in Jesus' case, the U-shaped table. What is that? It's very simply something that resides deep in every one of our hearts and it's expressed in different ways and it's it's simply pride you know when Jesus tells this story uh, 
what, what, he's, what he's doing is actually, and this is not a slight against Jesus, but he's not being altogether original here. He, he's not, he's not, when people read this in the Scripture and they're from, somewhat familiar with the Scripture, particularly the Old Testament, they're not going, wow, I never, I, 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 I never really knew what Jesus was getting at here. I don't know what he's talking about. No, what Jesus is doing is he's drawing attention to an old saying that's recorded in the book of Proverbs. Now, the book of Proverbs, if you're somewhat familiar with the Bible, you know it's pretty much in the center of the Bible. And it's right in the Old Testament. And the proverb goes like this. And A.V., if you could put that up there for us. Take a look. It comes from the book of uh, Proverbs, chapter 25. Do not exalt yourself in a king's presence. And do not claim a place that is a place of honor among great men. Rather, it's bitter for him to say to you, that is the king, come up here than for him to humiliate you before his nobles. You see how Jesus is drawing from the Old Testament here. He oftentimes does that. Again, what is Jesus really getting at here in this very passage? What he's really getting at here is again something that resides deep in every one of our hearts. Because what is, when, when you take a look at the passage and you look at that individual who takes it upon himself to seek out a place of honor rather than, as Jesus tells the story, beginning down below among all the other people, maybe in the back, so that a wedding host can come and say, hey, what are you doing in the back? You know what, why don't you get up and I have another place, a better place for you to sit. Better to do that than seek the place of honor and have somebody tell you, you know what, uh, this is not a place for you. You go sit in the back. That would be humiliating. That, you would be ashamed by that. Again, why does Jesus tell us this very simple story? To, to, to show us that the very thing that drives you and me to seek any kind of honor in our lives, any form of self-sufficiency, anything that will simply be noticed by other people, Jesus is teaching us that the very one thing that drives that, that act on our part is the issue of pride. Why, why, why is pride such a bad thing? Because in a sense what you're doing is you're taking God from above and you're bringing him down here and you're taking yourself down here and you're putting yourself above in a seat in the place of God or alongside of God. Let me explain something. Isn't this what Satan did in the very beginning? If you know anything about the Bible, you know the very thing that, that, that drove Satan to rebel against God was that fundamental sin of pride. What is the one sin that drove Adam and Eve in that simple story of the opening chapters of the first book of the Bible, Genesis? What is it that drove um, uh, Adam and Eve to partake of the fruit of the forbidden tree and thus want to be like God, the Bible says? It was pride. When Jesus, when we go back in the historical context of this passage, when, when Jesus told this simple story, you know who he was first and foremost addressing? Beyond you and me. He was addressing the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees. Elsewhere in the New Testament, Jesus says this. He says, you know, the Pharisees, these, these, these religious conservatives, those who wanted to be a part of a reform movement in Israel to bring people back to the law of God, you know what? Examine their heart. And, and also, take note of their actions, because what you see with the Pharisees is, he says, quote, they love the places of honor at religious feasts, and they love the best seats in the synagogue, the place of worship. The Pharisees in a place like this, they never sit in the back. What they do is they sit right here in the front. They want to be noticed. Place of honor. By the way, Jesus is not only addressing the Pharisees, he's also addressing his own disciples. Shortly before Jesus died, he had two disciples that were in what we call Jesus' inner circle. Jesus' inner circle, those close to him are Peter, James, and John. And James and John, they, they go to Jesus before his death and before his subsequent resurrection. They say to Jesus, Lord, when you enter into your kingdom... When you sit down at the table in your kingdom, 
and you announce victory, may we sit on either side of you, one on your left and one on your right. What drove that? What drove the Pharisees? What drove the disciples? It's pride. Years ago, during medieval times, there were theologians who developed what were called the seven deadly sins because they're very foundational sins. And I'd love to do a, a sermon series on that sometimes. Very instructive. And um, there are sins like lust and avarice and envy and anger and sloth and gluttony and these kinds of sins. The most fundamental sin that drives these other foundational sins are, guess what? Pride. Pride. So, when we read a passage like this, it's really a a passage that begs the question of every one of us, what form of uh, pride are we dealing with? What kind of form of pride are you dealing with? Now, It's very easy to kind of walk away gently from this and maybe think about other people because when you and I think of pride, we think of kind of overt egotism or narcissism where everybody's so self-absorbed and the world revolves around them. Or when we think about pride, we think of this, you know, chest thump it. I'm out there. Uh, Pride oftentimes comes in much more subtle forms, doesn't it? It's pride, for instance, that drives us to make excuses for ourselves when people note that we are in the wrong. Do you realize how difficult it is for us to to admit that we're wrong? Maybe you have that issue, maybe not. Maybe you're immediately apologetic. It's pride that prevents us from Here's one that we can maybe identify with, some of us. Uh, it's pride that keeps us from apologizing to our spouse or our kids when we have been in the wrong, when we have offended them. Anybody experience that in the past week? Husbands, wives, getting a little bit of tiff this past week? Husbands, you say you... When's the, husbands, when's the last time? And by the way, I, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be so self-effacing here, but... Physician, heal thyself, right? Preachers preach to themselves too. When was the last time that we said we're sorry to our wives? Or wives, you said sorry to your husbands. Or when you have maybe overextended yourself in terms of your anger or discipline with your little kids, when was the last time you said, Daddy needs to say he's sorry? Or kids, when was the last time you told your parents that you were sorry? It's pride that keeps us from asking for help when we need it. Have you ever had to ask for help from the deacons of the church? If you did, you know how hard that was. Nobody likes to do that. Yet the Bible requires us to search our hearts and ask ourselves the question, why was it difficult for us? Well, it just was. Well, we need to go deeper than that. Could have been some form of subtle pride. It's pride that sometimes makes us look down upon others, especially if we were somewhat theologically adept and knowledgeable. Sometimes it's pride that drives us to look down on fellow Christians who perhaps don't share the same kind of doctrines in life that we do. It's pride that keeps us from repenting and dying to ourselves and seeking Jesus, and it's pride that maybe drives that little voice in our heads to say, okay, pastor, can you just kind of let it go now? Yeah, we get the point, we get the point. Do we, do we? Right. Do I, do you? You know, one of the, one of the most um, serious forms of pride and painful forms of pride is actually found in the pastoral ministry. Did you know that? How many, how many pastors themselves deals, deal with pride? You know, what, you know what happens in the ministry? Pastors do a lot of compare and contrast. 
And they look at other pastors and the churches that they have. And you know, the, the temptation is always the grass is greener on the other side. I'm dealing with the difficulties. I don't deserve this. Lord, why have you given me these people kind of like Moses with the people of God in the wilderness, you know? And there's, there's, there's all kinds of stories about there where this pastor comes in, he's got a lot of gifts, and he begins with a church of a group of maybe 15, 20 people in his living room. And before you know it, within three or four years, that church is at 2,000 people. How do you account for that? So it's pride that drives, oh, why do I have to deal with this situation? Why do I have to deal with this little church plant? And it's also pride that drives the envy to say, why couldn't I have a church like that? I want to share something with you that I I normally don't share. And it it comes in the form of, of, uh, we don't do this often, but every once in a while I like to do this. It it comes in the form of of a presentation that a pastor named Tim Keller gave his church in New York City. He himself, many people call a successful pastor. But he was old and he was humble and he was well-seasoned. And before he died of pancreatic cancer in May of last year, he took the time to assemble his church and he spoke to them by video and he spoke to area pastors in New York City and pastors generally speaking. And he drew upon a passage in Jeremiah And I want to share it with you now. A.V., if you could put that up. Just take a look at this, if you would. Forget about your reputation. Jeremiah 45.5. This is what Jeremiah says to his secretary, Baruch. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. Genesis 11 tells us that people tend to go to the city and make a name for themselves. They get excited. They're going to come. They're going to do well in their work. And by the way, ministers very often come to New York City to make a name for themselves. Just letting you know that. You know, I got a, I'm a minister in New York City. I'm cool. I'm going to do well here. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. Don't worry about your reputation. Don't worry about your credentials. Ministers do not identify, don't make your ministry success your identity. So this, if things don't go well, you just feel like an utter failure. You just freak out. People don't make getting a big name in New York City your main thing. Lift up Jesus' name. Hallowed be thy name. Forget yourself. Forget your reputation. Do what you can to lift up God's name. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Even New Yorkers, of course, all New Yorkers are seeking great things for themselves. No, no. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. Thank you for listening. Forget about your reputation. You know, um, maybe we started over, or maybe I butt in. If I butt in, I'm sorry. But I think the point is well made. He cites Jeremiah, do you seek great things for yourself? Listen, do you seek a seat of honor, as Jesus puts it in the passage, at the table? Jesus says, don't seek it. Jeremiah says, seek it not. You know one of the, the most devastating forms of pride are actually the, the, the pride that says, I don't need God. I don't need Jesus. Do you seek great things for yourself? Do you seek a place of honor at the table? Seek it not. However, however, do seek a place at this table. Because this is, this is, in a sense, this is not a, this is not a place of honor. This is a place for those who are humble. And one of the most profound and devastating forms of pride is that, is, is when any one of us Or anyone in this world says, you know what, I'm fine on my own. I don't need Jesus. And by the way, I don't need this either. Because you know what this this table points to? It points us simply to Jesus. And the fact that we are all sinners and the fact that we must humble ourselves and come to the end of ourselves in order that we might find our life in Jesus Christ. Now, you think of someone like the Apostle Paul, who's a wonderful example of this. Before Paul was converted to Jesus Christ, you know what Paul was like? He was a a man who sought a place of honor. It was the Apostle Paul 
who, who before he was converted to Jesus Christ said, yeah, you know what? I knew about religion. I knew about ritual. I knew about the law of God. I was well-versed in the law of God. And as far as adherence to the law of God, he says, I was blameless. In Philippians 3, he says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, I was a Jew of Jews. Or as we would say today, I was a Christian among Christians. I knew the ways. I knew the law of God. The Apostle Paul says, as far as the law was concerned, he says, I was a Pharisee. You know what he's saying? He says, I was a religious conservative. I was no liberal. I was no progressive. I was no, not one of those groups of people that didn't have any kind of respect for the authority and the inspiration and infallibility and inerrancy of this book. I was there. And as far as adherence to law was concerned, I was blameless. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, Jesus, who sees all things, saw into the heart of the Apostle Paul, and he had different plans for the Apostle Paul. So you know this story, right? In Acts chapter 9, we read how Paul sub uh, Jesus subdues Paul on the road to Damascus and even blinds him and causes Paul to be humbled in that kind of situation. And it was in the point of that blindness that the Apostle Paul humbled himself and he repented and he drew near to Jesus and he ended up becoming one of the greatest apologists, defenders, and promoters of the Christian faith that there ever was. That was Paul. And after he was converted, this is what he said, all of what I had and all of what I did, I now count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I count everything as loss, and I count them but rubbish. Literally, in the original language, dog excrement. For the sake of gaining Jesus Christ. Yeah, that stuff that you see on the sidewalk sometimes, that smelly stuff that you sometimes put your feet in. He says, that's, that's how we consider my former life, dog excrement, compared to to the blessing of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. And you know what? It's the same Apostle Paul who warns us about pride in this table here, the Lord's Supper. He says, this table, again, is not for the proud. It's not for the self-sufficient. It is not for the unrepentant, but it's for those who are dirty and needy and repentant and who see their need for Jesus. This is how he puts it in 1 Corinthians 11, and I'm going to repeat this passage in just a moment as we read the Lord's Supper form together. For whoever eats the bread and drinks of the cup in an unworthy manner, that is, an unrepentant manner, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a person examine himself, that is, let him probe his heart, and in humility, humility let him find his life in Christ, and then let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Jesus puts it like this in our passage. Do you seek a place of honor for yourself? Seek it not. For everyone who exalts himself and lifts himself high actually will be humbled. Ah, but the one who humbles himself and sees his need, he will be exalted. Or as Tim Keller puts it, don't worry about your reputation and certainly don't rest in your religiosity. Think that impresses God? It doesn't. Rather, forget yourself and find your rest and find your life in Jesus, the very thing that this table points to this morning. May that kind of spirit of humility reside in each and every one of us. Certainly, we should pray for that now. Please join me, if you would, in a brief prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for that very thing that comes so hard to us, naturally speaking, and that is humility. Lord, you tell us in the Bible that the greatest desire of your heart is that we come to you not full of ourselves, but broken and contrite, repentant, and needy. Lord Jesus, we need you. And we pray now that as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, as we think about the bread and wine that points to the sacrificial body and blood of Jesus we pray, O oh God, that you would work your spirit in our hearts to create not just humility, but a great amount of joy for knowing that when we come humbly before you, O oh God, we are not only in right standing with you, but we are objects of your deep-seated and eternal love. So, Father, drive that home to our hearts here this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.